uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Lisa and the rest of the organizers for hosting uh, Dig here in uh, Newcastle. Um, I'm enjoying it so far and looking forward to a lot, uh, a lot more of the coming days. Um, I'll be talking about some work that I've been doing in uh, Armenia at a site called Ahitu uh, 3. Uh, we've heard a little bit already about the Caucasus uh, from uh, Marika. Uh, this is in a slightly different region, but I'll first of all provide a bit of background to the site, uh, the archaeology, and also the geographic and geological setting. Um, and there are a couple of key research questions that I'd like to address. And some of these are the reasons that I wanted to present them here um, at uh, DIG. First of all, I'll present a bit about what some of the site formation processes are, particularly some of the uh, geogenic depositional processes. Um, I'll focus on kind of an interesting case study uh, that we can see here at I2 of looking at tephra deposition in caves and how tephra enters into a cave system. Um, I'll focus on combustion features, as you can see from Marika and Magnus. This is one of uh, the tubing in group's uh, favorite topics, so I'd like to focus on that a little bit. Um, and then I would also like to look at some questions that the arche archaeologist raised to me, um, <clears throat> which was how can we link uh, some of these formation processes in the mycomorphology with paleoenvironmental proxies, proxies that were found at the site. Um, in particular, uh, some of the ice lensing structures that we saw. Can we really use them as proxies for cooling? With that, then, I'll uh, conclude, um, conclude my presentation. Uh, Marika already pointed out this region of the world to us, but we're looking here in uh, the General Caucasus region. Uh, so it's Serbly and those sites are up here. I'm working down here in the southern part of the region, um, actually kind of where the Caucasus starts to join into uh, the Zagros, Zagros Mountains um, in Iran. Uh, the Caucasus has been the, uh, a key location for Paleolithic archaeology for many decades. Part of the reason is that it's a key route for biogeographic expansions out of Africa. We know this, of course, from the Lower Paleolithic. Uh, sites like Dimanisi, we see some of the earliest evidence for hominins moving out of Africa. Um, a lot of the research that's been done in the Caucasus has really focused on Lower Paleolithic and Middle Paleolithic occupations. And this is because we don't have a lot of uh, well excavated or even uh, discovered upper Paleolithic sites in the Caucasus region. Uh, some e exceptions to this, of course, are in uh, the country of Georgia. Uh, some of the sites that Marika presented, including Setserblia, there we have stratified sequences of the upper Paleolithic. But in Armenia and the southern part of the Caucasus region, we actually, up until uh, the, d the discovery and excavation of Ahitu III, did not have any stratified upper Paleolithic sites. So Ahitu II three itself is actually a very important site for the region because it's the first time that we uh, can look at uh, some of the initial popu uh, population of the Caucasus uh, by modern humans beginning around 40,000 years ago. So here you can see a distribution of Paleolithic sites uh, within Armenia focusing on the middle and the upper Paleolithic. Uh, middle Paleolithic ones are much more numerous as you can see here. Ayu 3 is located right here. There is one other upper Paleolithic site. It's an open air site um, and it dates to much later than, uh, than Ayu 2. Um, it dates to uh, uh, post LGM. Uh, the setting for Ai2 is a volcanic setting. Uh, we have a sequence of uh, Pleistocene aged basalt flows, uh, which are indicated in pink here, beginning around about 1.4 uh, million years ago, um, extending up until around 100,000 years ago. Uh, the landscape is very mountainous, and when we have a or when we had a basalt flow, these flows would actually block. Uh, some of the valleys creating paleo lakes as a result of damming. Um, <clears throat> so around 900,000 years ago, around the area of where Ayu2 Cave is now situated, we had what we called uh, Paleo Lake Voratan. Um, eventually, a uh, river in incision led to the draining of these lakes, but in the region today, we do still have uh, some of these Paleo Lake sediments that are preserved, which are composed of marls and also um, uh, diatomaceous earth. So here you get a sense of what the landscape looks like around Ai2. This is the Voratan River, uh, the river valley in which uh, the cave site is located. We have the Paleogene basement. Um, here we see some of these basalt flows, and as I mentioned, uh, some of these pockets of the Paleo Lake sediments. <clears throat> so the rivers here have deeply incised uh, gorges uh, into the landscape. Um, located up onto these plateaus is where we find some of these cave sites. So here is uh, the village of Ahitu. Uh, we're, uh, we're situated about 1,600 meters above sea level. 
Um, in general, the climate here <clears throat> uh, ranges from below freezing in the winter, so about uh, minus 8 degrees, um, and can get up to 20, even 30, uh, 30 degrees in the summer. So we look, are looking at very cold winters, uh, warm to uh, hot, uh, hot summers. It's a relatively dry environment with about 500, uh, 500 uh, millimeters uh, per year. Uh, within <clears throat> this picture, you can see the cave site here of Aitu in the background. It's located within one of these basalt flows, uh, which formed between 111 and 126,000 uh, years ago. Here is a deeply incised Vortan uh, uh, river valley that I showed you. And we believe here that part of this is what we call the Paleo-Vortan Valley, one of the older drainages of uh, the plateau. So one of the reasons I chose to show IE23 uh, to dig is that it's actually a very interesting site for a cave. When we think of caves, we often automatically think about karstic systems, limestones. Uh, IE2 is a cave that's formed within basalt. Um, it's what we call a blister cave. So when you have a basalt flow, okay, it's liquid moving across the surface, you have gases that get trapped within, within the basalt. Those gases can form bubbles. And then when the basalt flow hardens, Okay, you have a cavity that's present within the basalt. When you have incision then of the basalt, it can expose the cavity, providing a space uh, in which uh, people can live. So that's what we're looking at here with I2, this kind of rounded dome shape here is very typical for these types of basaltic blister caves. Here you can see uh, the site before excavation and after the damage was done by the archeologists over several years. And <clears throat> Excavations began in 2009, con uh, concluded in 2012 or uh, 13, and the archaeologists uncovered uh, 12 geological uh, layers, which they ended up grouping into what they call archaeological horizons. I will refer to these as AHs. Um, they identified uh, seven AHs beginning here at the base, uh, about six meters, or sorry, five meters of depth below the surface, extending up to age three, which you see here. These are all the Pleistocene aged uh, deposits, and then we have Holocene aged deposits on top of that. <clears throat> um, it's been extensively radiocarbon dated, and you can see here that the uh, ages for these archaeological horizons uh, range from about 24,000 years ago at the top and extend down to 39,000 uh, years ago at the base. I'll point out that excavations did end on bedrock. In fact, it ends on a pyroclastic flow, which predates the basalt flow in which, uh, the, cave, uh, which, in which the cave was formed. So this, these are the basal uh, deposits at the site. So here's just an overview of what uh, the sequence looks like. You can see here at the base, AH7, uh, dating to around 40,000 to 36,000 years ago. Generally, slightly rocky deposit. This is overlain by a much uh, finer grained uh, deposit with uh, some occasional uh, rock fall. Is it a hard hat area, Chris? It should be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Different safety requirements in Armenia than in uh, the UK. <laughs> so then here, moving up into AH5 and AH4, we, it's dominated by, um, by, by a large rockfall event. If we move higher up, we see that we get into uh, <clears throat> uh, the later Pleistocene deposits, much more gravelly dep uh, deposits associated with, uh, with silt, and then overlain by uh, thin Holocene, uh, Holoc Holocene deposit. So let's look at some of the geogenic modes of deposition at the cave. And of course, uh, one of the main agents of deposition here of, is rockfall. We can see that we have very large boulders that accumulated. These, of course, are all local in origin, coming from the immediate vicinity of the shelter itself. So they're all uh, basaltic rock. We see that this rockfall <clears throat> can be quite large. We also see evidence for it here in thin section in the form of a coarse gravel of spall uh, that's uh, originating from, uh, from the bedrock. This is mostly dominant a little bit higher up in the sequence beginning in uh, layer five and going up into layer three. But if we look at uh, some of the finer fraction um, you can see some kind of interesting, interesting characteristics. Um, <clears throat> the fine fraction is mostly dominated by silts and clays. Um, clays, particularly in the lower part of the sequence, uh, becomes a little bit siltier as we move up. 
um, what we see is that we have some near formation of clay occurring within the cave. So for example, here uh, we see some weathering of volcanic minerals. This is uh, what used to be uh, pumice. You can see the typical vesicular microstructure here. You can see here in cross-polarized light uh, that the biofringens is very typical of the rest of the clay matrix around here. So this looks like a piece of pumice that's actually uh, weathered in place into, uh, into a clay mineral. So although we see some autogenic uh, origins for the fine fraction within uh, the cave itself, most of the fine fraction, um, particularly in the lower part of the sequence uh, from uh, layer five below, uh, appears to be getting transported into the cave, mostly through uh, water deposition. We see that uh, the fine fraction is dominated by <coughs> uh, these uh, nicely laminated deposits with some coarser material grading up into finer material here, and uh, kind of a general sequence of uh, this, which you can also see here as well. So we're seeing some low energy surface flow, bringing a lot of the fine material into the cave. Um, there's a possibility that some of this may be related to alluvial processes, particularly from the Paleo uh, Voratan, uh, <clears throat> when there was actually a river flowing in that valley. What's also very interesting is that we see um, that we have geogenic carbonates uh, forming within the basaltic cave. Um, these are in the forms of fragments of tufa, which you can see here, also some tufa right here. Um, it's present throughout the Pleistocene deposits and suggests that we had <coughs> uh, some type of groundwater seep uh, within the cave. Here, for example, you can see um, an example of some of the bedrock uh, a fragment of the bedrock contained within the sediment, and here on top of it is a laminated speleothem that formed directly in the bedrock, broke off, and got incorporated into, into the deposit. So in the lower part of the sequence, we see a lot of these water laying silts and clays. When we move higher up, starting in uh, layer four and in layer three, we see a very big uh, change in the types of sediments. It's still relatively silty, a bit of clay, but silt is more dominant. We don't see any evidence for these nice laminations or graded bedding, no evidence for water lane deposits. It's very massive, very little void space. Um, and we start to see carbonates present as well, but in the forms of a carbonate silt. And again, in association with quartz silt, with mica, when we start seeing this, it su suggests to us that we might be seeing a shift more towards aeolian deposition in the later part of the sequence, something kind of like a loss. Um, <clears throat> just following up with the carbonates as well, we do see some post-depositional carbonates, some pedogenic carbonates or pedo features. Um, these are more common in the lower part of the sequence and are generally present as in the form of hypocodings along uh, some channel voids. Okay, so if we summarize what we see uh, 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 throughout the sequence at IE2, we find fragments of tufa throughout the sequence. We seem to be having groundwater seeps occurring uh, within the cave. Uh, there's a marked increase in Ebuli and Spall uh, beginning in AH5 and really peaking in AH4 and the lower part of AH3. Um, and we also see a shift from water lane deposits um, uh, probably towards aeolian deposits beginning in AH4 as well. So there seems to be a pretty big change uh, from the earlier part of the sequence to the later part of the sequence in terms of depositional processes. So we'll keep that in mind, um, <clears throat> but I want to point out another very kind of interesting depositional process that's occurring at the site, which is related to tephra. It's a very volcanically active region, um, and we do find tephra layers at the site. Uh, you can see one of them right here. This is what they call the black tephra la uh, layer. It's been uh, chemically characterized as a tracheandesite. Um, and when we look at this, it looks like a very discrete depositional episode, a very kind of typical tephra layer. Um, we collected a micromorphological block from this, and what we could see is that there is a discrete depositional event, what we could call the kind of the tephra, uh, the tephra event, uh, right here. But actually, when we take a microstratigraphic approach to this, we see that it's a multi-phased event of accumulation of tephra within the site. Um, we can actually identify an initial phase of deposition of tephra just a few millimeters thick. This may have been one of kind of the initial eruptions of the volcano. Then we have the main deposition of the tephra up here. This is followed by several centimeters of redeposition of the tephra. So remember, in this phase of accumulation of uh, sediment in the cave, we still have water deposition, material getting washed into the cave. So we have the initial blanketing of aeolian tephra, which enters into the cave. 
but the landscape surrounding the cave is also blanketed in tephra. So as we have uh, water getting washed into the cave, it's also washing in more of this tephra as well. Okay, so we see that it's actually a rather complex process of bringing these grains of tephra into the site. And this is something to keep in mind when we're looking at characterizing individual events versus multiple events of tephra, tephra deposition. So you can see here the initial deposition of the tephra right here. Here's the main uh, tephra deposition, uh, well-sorted, very angular grains of the tephra. And here we can see some water lane and reworked tephra. The tephra appears more rounded as well as we would expect. Um, <clears throat> I'll just point out some of the characteristics of some of the combustion features that we see at the site. Um, here you can see one of these combustion features, a classic red, black, white, uh, with uh, calcareous uh, ashes on top, uh, charred organic material, and a reddened uh, base below this. Um, a lot of the combustion features look like this, just kind of very individual, discrete combustion features, probably very ephemeral and short use. Um, but these we see in the lower part of the sequence. For example, here we see we have the reddened surface, and then charcoal and ash mixed together. In fact, here we have a series of stack combustion features uh, separated by a geogenic deposition. So we have people building and using a fire, abandoning it, and then revisiting the site at a later period, building a fire and abandoning it, etc. Now this is occurring in the lower part of the sea. Oh, I'll point out just quickly, uh, uh, we did some micromorphology on these features, or sorry, some micro-FTIR on these features. And the reddened uh, sediment here and outside here do not show any uh, differences in the hydroxyl peaks, uh, which suggests either that this was never heated, which we find unlikely, or that the heating of the substrate below the combustion feature uh, did not uh, achieve temperatures above 400 degrees. So this would suggest that these are very either short burning or not very intensive, uh, intensive combustion features. When we move up into the higher part of the sequence, we find a lot more combusted material um, in association with, uh, for example, uh, charcoal lenses and charcoal smears, but we don't find a lot or any of these kind of intact red, black, white uh, combustion features. So th there seems to be some diachronic variation in what uh, the combustion features uh, look like. So if we kind of summarize all of that together, we see that in the lower part of the sequence, we have evidence for low temperature burning and ephemeral use of these um, combustion features followed by abandonment. But higher up in uh, layer three, we find very few intact cars, mostly charcoal scatters. There's no evidence for geogenic uh, reworking of the charcoal. Um, so we think that this might actually be related more to hearth rakeout and site maintenance uh, activities. Um, this change in combustion features also corresponds with an increase in uh, the density of archaeological materials and an intensification in uh, site use. So there may be here reflected in the combustion features a shift from more ephemeral logistics site use uh, to more uh, residential use of the site. Now, one of the uh, key uh, aspects of the IU2 project was looking at uh, paleoenvironmental signatures as recorded within uh, the cave sediment. Uh, they recovered uh, pollen from the site, they recovered and studied microfauna from the site from charcoal, and they were able to reconstruct um, a, a kind of a paleoenvironmental interpretation over time, which generally seems to track uh, a shift from more temperate and humid conditions at the base into more cooling and eventually uh, cooling and drying uh, phases towards the top. Now when I was uh, showing the thin sections to the archaeologist, uh, I mentioned that we have very beautiful expressions of ice lensing structures at the site. Uh, I mean, I used this picture in my uh, lectures uh, to show what, what uh, ice lensing should look like. And they were really interested in saying, well, can we use this to actually track uh, temperature changes within the sediments as well? And I said that was kind of interesting. We know how these features form from a, a lot of studies in the literature, in soils, and gelosols, and it's been reported as being found in cave sites as well. Um, in the Swabian Ura cave sites, um, in Teopatra cave, they found this and said this is an indicator for cold conditions uh, and freezing. Um, just as an example here, you can see that we have these nice ice lensing uh, structures and also cappings as well. To make a long story short, what we found is that uh, the ice lensing structures were more pronounced in the lower part of the sequence when we have temperate conditions and not when we have the cold conditions at the very top of the sequence. And this was very interesting. 
Um, but I think it's important to remember that these ice lensing structures form, or are, uh, the formation is controlled by several variables besides freezing, right? So one of them is grain size, right? They only occur in certain types of uh, deposits, usually finer grain deposits. And the other one that's always important to keep in mind is water availability, right? So if you don't have water, you can make it as cold as you want, but you aren't going to be freezing. <laughs> you don't have anything to freeze to form uh, these structures. So what I think we may be seeing here is that we're actually tracking a change in water availability and change in moisture regime at the site with these ice lensing features rather than any type of uh, temperature variation. So that as we move higher up, we see that there's evidence for drying out. And I think that we may actually be seeing <coughs> that the absence of these ice lensing structures could be related to that rather than any type of freeze thaw. So to me, this suggests, as a w word of warning, that we should be a bit cautious when using just kind of single individual indicators for, um, uh, for a, a climatic reconstruction. But that's better to look more at kind of the holistic formation processes that we uh, can reconstruct. So I think um, I'm already past my time, and there's coffee. So um, conclusions are what I've just talked about. And I'll jump over then to acknowledgments and thank, uh, thank everybody who's participated in the project and funded it. Thanks.